Okay, it is June 25th, 2022, Saturday. Here we are, South Beach Gospel Ministries on South Beach on Saturdays. We're uh, interrupting our regularly scheduled programming to bring you a special message in light of yesterday's Supreme Court decision. Uh, shocking, if not totally unexpected, reversing Roe versus Wade. We were going to talk about part two of the volume of the book Jesus in the Old Testament, but as a result of yesterday's uh, you know, precedent setting reversal of Roe, which, you know, got rid of a constitutional right to abortion on demand, which has been the law of the land for 49 unfortunate years, based upon some poor reasoning that the Supreme Court used. I mean, many of you guys know that I'm a lawyer. You know, I've actually filed a brief in the United States Supreme Court. Um, and I was there a couple years ago for a reunion, and I was kind of looking at uh, a picture of uh, one of the former chief justices, Roger B. Taney, a guy who went to Harvard Law School, very smart guy. He's the guy that authored the uh, infamous uh, Dred Scott decision that said that, you know, black Americans were only two thirds human and one third not human, and therefore they could be bought and sold like chattel, like animals. And, uh, you know, some other notorious decisions in the United States Supreme Court's history, Plessy v. Ferguson, that said separate but equal is constitutional and not a violation of equal protection and basically created segregation in the United States between blacks and whites. So that got reversed as well. That was precedent for a long time. And Roe versus Wade, I think, is the third of the three greatest disastrous decisions in the history of the United States Supreme Court. Roe versus Wade said that there was a constitutional right to abortion on demand based upon a privacy right that's implied in the Constitution. That really only applies to pregnant women. It doesn't apply to men or it doesn't apply to non-pregnant women. And so that got reversed yesterday, thankfully. But unfortunately, in the almost 50 years since Roe versus Wade was decided in January of 1973, about 75 million American babies have been murdered in their mother's wombs. And of that, about 80% were African-American babies. So some people have suggested uh, that this is, or Roe was really the outscouring or outgrowth of the shameful American eugenics program that started in the late 19, or excuse me, late 1800s and grew to real international acclaim during the 1920s based in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, which genetics laboratory still exists to this day. It was when it became clear that Adolf Hitler was a follower and supporter of the American eugenics program and the scientists over at Cold Spring Harbor, New York. And he, you know, wrote things uh, supporting and commending them that people became aware of the American eugenics program and how they were doing things like sterilizing people of color and people uh, who were considered mentally defective or didn't have a high enough IQ and they were sterilizing them without consent and against the law, their, their will. And so again, you know, yesterday's disastrous decision reversing 50 years almost of Roe, which now returns to the states, the right to decide for themselves amongst the people and amongst their elected legislators, whether or not they're going to limit abortion or allow abortion on demand, so on and so forth. About half the states have automatically uh, outlawed uh, abortion as a result of Roe because of these sort of kick-in laws that were passed after Roe that said if Roe was ever reversed as the law of the land, then abortion in our state is illegal. And half the states have already decided that. So the arguments in the media yesterday that about 80% of the American public wants abortion on demand. I would point out that the United States of America is the only country in the entire world that has aborted 75 million babies in the last 50 years and has abortion on demand. No other countries have that. And so for us to be considered a Christian country, that's another debate that I've had with my good friend Ben, who's also a Harvard grad, as to whether or not the United States of America is a Christian country. Well, we're gonna look at that next week in a special teaching that we have based upon and surrounding the approaching 4th of July weekend, Mystery Babylon, the United States of America, and the Founding Fathers. But we won't be talking about that today. Today we're going to talk about the topic of whether abortion on demand or abortion in, in period is acceptable. Is it okay in the eyes of God? And the reason why we're doing that, though 
South Beach Gospel Ministries. Those of you that haven't liked and subscribed yet, please do. South Beach Gospel Ministries on YouTube. Like and subscribe, smash the like button, click on the notification button so you can get all of our updated uh, YouTube videos as soon as they're available. But to the extent that this is really an earth shattering, one of the most important legal decisions to come out of the Supreme Court in, in, in maybe a hundred years. I mean, since Roe itself was decided 50 years ago. Um, so a number of people, myself included, when I was in high school and college, even though I took an advanced placement molecular biology class and I knew all about, you know, uh, genetics, the Punnett square, how a uh, spermatozoan can uh, fertilize an egg and the cell division, I had memorized all of that stuff. And even though I knew the science behind, you know, molecular biology, specifically with relate, relation to, uh, you know, fertility and reproduction of human beings, I believe the propaganda that just said that, you know, an aborted baby is just a fetus, therefore it's not alive, it's just a bunch of chemicals and a bunch of cells collected together. By the way, having also taken uh, Latin in high school in preparation for law school, I learned that the word for baby in Latin is fetus. So to call it a fetus, which is what the Roe Court did, um, really doesn't, it's not telling you anything. It's not, you know, they, they use a word like fetus to make you think it's not a human being. It's just the Latin word, you know, like people say rapture is not in the Bible. That's because the Bible, the King James Bible is written in English. And if you read a Latin Bible, you'd have rapturo. So, you know, what the promoters of abortion on demand did is kind of tried to euphemize the euthanization, that is to say the killing of babies by not referring to them as babies. Call them something else, call them a fetus, call them by a foreign language. And so what we're going to look at today though are certain scriptures that kind of the Lord put in my mind yesterday as I was thinking about what we we're going to be talking about on Saturday and we we're really going to go on to part two of our message related to the uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, the volume of the book, volume two. Um, the Lord kind of put it on my heart like, man, the Roe versus Wade could be decided soon. You should have something to address the people from a biblical standpoint because the Bible does speak very plainly on the issue of whether or not God sees a fetus in the womb as a human being and whether or not God thinks that life is precious, just as precious as any natural born, fully out of the womb child or any adult. And so we're gonna look at those things. And so again, as Bible believing Christians, which many of you guys are, hopefully most of you guys are, and you know, of course we welcome any uh, viewers and watchers that are curious about the Lord as well, just like our Muslim friend from two weeks ago. Um, but many of you guys, and I would say most of you guys that are regular subscribers are already believers. So the question remains, is it possible for you guys or other people out there in the American public to be deceived kind of like I was by propaganda in high school and college that said abortion was okay? Um, and so when we look at the verses that we are going to look at today that I think the Lord kind of put in my heart and mind, um, it makes very clear what God's position is and therefore what our position should be vis-a-vis -vis abortion, whether beyond demand or, you know, uh, based upon different things. I mean, how many people do you know that gave birth to a child because they were denied a right to an abortion as a result of some stranger on stranger rape? You hear about that being a justification for abortion on demand. But you know, that kind of thing doesn't really happen too often, right? Of the 75 million American babies that have been aborted, killed, murdered in the womb, since Roe was decided in January of 1973, as I've already pointed out, 80% have been minority babies. Um, and I would say a very, very small percentage was as a result of some type of a rape that resulted in, oh my goodness, a pregnancy. Um, as tragic as that would be. Um, so let's take a look and see what the verses in the Bible say about how God sees not just little children, but pre-born children. And that's exactly what the gravamen of the road decision was. They said, well, a fetus isn't a baby. A fetus is pre-born and until the fetus is viable, meaning it can survive on the womb on its own, um, then you can abort it. But viability in and of itself was a ridiculous pseudo legal scientific standard which no one could live up to. If you took a world-class Olympic decathlon and dropped them on the South Pole or in Antarctica or in the middle of Siberia with no clothes on, he'd be dead pretty soon. Is it because he's non-viable? 
Well, he's non-viable in that environment with no assistance. Now, if he had a parka and thermals and he had like energy gels and all kinds of stuff, he could survive, but he would need assistance from others. He wouldn't be able to self-produce that. If you took a four-year-old or a three-year-old and put him in the backyard, the backyard could be filled with apple trees, orange trees, all types of stuff, banana trees, but that four-year-old, three-year-old is gonna starve to death because they're not gonna know how to cut a tree down and harvest fruit from the tree in a, order to be able to eat to survive. Now a five-year-old might be able to survive in the woods for a few days or a few weeks at a time, but a three or four-year-old, no. Two-year-old, no. So are they non-viable? Does that mean that we could kill them as well? So again, the three worst decisions in the history of the United States Supreme Court, Dred Scott, which was written by a Harvard man that said that black people in America are not fully human, they're only two-thirds human, therefore the one-third of them that's not human make some animals and they can be bought, sold, and traded like chattel, like animals. That was eventually reversed, but for a long time it was the law of the land. There was another decision, disastrous Supreme Court, Plessy v. Ferguson. And again, I, you know, I filed a brief in the United States Supreme Court. I have a lot of respect for the United States Supreme Court. It was there for a reunion a couple years ago. Um, but they've made some disastrously terrible legal decisions, the three worst of which we're talking about Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal, created segregation based upon race in the United States of America in schools, lunch rooms, public facilities. It was a disaster that caused all type of unrest and heartache here in the United States. And that was eventually reversed as well. And Roe is the last of those three great, terrible decisions in the history of the United States Supreme Court, in my humble opinion, um, that was finally done away with yesterday, thank goodness. But uh, a little bit, you know, a day, a day late, dollar short for the 75 million American babies that have been already murdered in the womb as a result of the decision. Margaret Sanger somewhere is celebrating that man, Planned Parenthood was really just uh, ethnic cleansing in the United States of America. The American eugenics program that Adolf Hitler used as inspiration for the Nazi Holocaust really lived itself out in legal clothing in the Roe versus Wade decision. And as a result, you know, uh, almost 100 million American babies perished. So let's take a look and see what the Word of God says. Because remember, and the reason why I pointed out those three horrific decisions by the United States Supreme Court, Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, Roe versus Wade, um, and, uh, you know, uh, goodness forbid, uh, the Dred Scott decision. Those were the law of the land for a long time. And then eventually, other smart Harvard and Yale trained lawyers who became judges, who became justices of the United States Supreme Court, said, man, this is wrong. We got to change this. So what the supreme judges and the supreme law of the land says today could change tomorrow or uh, 50, tom 50 years of tomorrow's later. So the point is, when we are going to eventually be judged by judge, the judge of all the earth, it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right we eventually are gonna be judged by the ultimate judge, God. And so we wanna make sure that the things we decide to do are based upon what his law says and not what the law of the several states or the several nations here in the world say when it conflicts. And there is coming a time again when Christianity will be outlawed and begins the law to believe in the Bible. Now, certainly I heard some reports that there were possibility of, you know, you know, attacks of violence or vandalism against Christian churches and Catholic churches as a result of Roe. And I heard Gloria Alred, who's a famous uh, feminist uh, women's civil rights attorney, saying that the re reversal of Roe was to be blamed on the Christians. And the Christians in America, you know, imposed their will upon the people through, uh, you know, pressuring the Supreme Court and that we should blame the Christians for Roe being reversed. And that kind of talk causes concern and certainly we see in scripture that just like it was in the time of Jesus and just like it was in time of Peter and Paul when following Jesus and becoming a fundamentalist believer in Jesus was against the law and it eventually resulted in you know Christians believers in Jesus being put to death for their faith that time is coming again now whether that will come in full before the rapture or after the rapture with the tribulation saints we're just gonna have to wait around to see but certainly the comments that were made by some of the more radical and vocal uh, opponents of the court, Supreme Court's decision yesterday reversing Roe 
kind of you know gives 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 pause for concern and that was one of the reasons why we decided Kim wouldn't come out today because we didn't know what to expect when we came on South Beach. Are gonna, were there going to be protesters? Were people who know that we're outspoken Christians promoting the word of God? Would they be waiting for us to, you know, riot and, you know, throw stuff at us and, you know, uh, uh, burn us in effigy or even worse? Uh, fortunately, that, that didn't happen. We're down here at South Beach. Beautiful day. The wind's not blowing too hard. A little hot. But it's a great day for a Bible study. We don't know how many days we have left until the rapture occurs, till the Lord comes for us, and it's time to go home. And as a result of that, we're going to use every opportunity we can to bring the Word of God. So today, we're looking at how does God see not just human beings, not just babies, but how does God see pre-born humans in the womb? Let's start out by going to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Jeremiah is one of the three big-time prophets in Judaism. Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, I would argue, are the big three. Now, some others may come up with three, uh, you know, three different names or combinations of three different names and all that. But Jeremiah is a very important prophet. It's important to note that in the very first chapter of the book of Jeremiah, this is what we find at verse 5. And it says this, Speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah says, Before... Well, actually, uh, he's speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah is writing down the words of God. So God is basically dictating to Jeremiah his opinion about Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was one of God's big-time prophets, and God is basically telling him, before you were even born, I already had chosen you and I already knew you, which totally destroys the... Uh, moral underpinnings of something like Roe versus Wade or the argument that uh, a fetus isn't human until it comes out of the womb or at the very least until it uh, reaches the stage of viability. This is what God has to say about the pre-born, not yet out of the womb, Jeremiah. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Wait a minute, so God knew Jeremiah before he was a fetus in the belly. So the argument that many Christians have debated whether or not life begins at conception, certainly it begins at the very least at conception because God is saying he knew Jeremiah before he was formed in the belly by God. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, meaning I set you apart, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, I'm a child. I cannot speak, I'm a child. I thought about abortion. Uh, when I read that last portion of that verse 5, those aborted babies that the Supreme Court in the United States in Roe called fetuses that were non-viable, they couldn't speak because they were just a baby. They couldn't say, don't kill me, you know, I, you know look, my mom, you know, doesn't want to, you know, I got nothing against my mom and her right to choose stuff, but I, I want to live. If you'd ask any one of the 75 million American babies aborted since Roe, I would be willing to bet every single one of them would have said, give me a chance at life. Let me out of the womb and see how life goes. Maybe it won't be all sunshine and roses, but at least give me a shot. Let me have at least one sunrise and one sunset. Let me have one day in the park. Well, let me, you know, play on a swing set just one time before I'm dead. You know, the kids that were in the womb couldn't speak because they were babies. And God says the same thing. He says, I set you apart. I chose you to be my prophet before you even formed into a fetus in the womb. When you were a baby and you couldn't speak, you couldn't say anything. So of course, the 75 million American babies that were aborted as a result of Roe never were given a voice by the Supreme Court and whether or not they should be executed at a whim of their mother. Whether or not the father agreed to it or not, he didn't have a, a decision in, in the determinant, even though the male contributes exactly 50% of the genetic material of every human being, and the female contributes the other 50%. God set it up that way on purpose. Only the pregnant woman would have a sua sponte a right to choose whether that baby lives or dies. The courts couldn't get involved. The, the government couldn't get involved. You know, Roe versus Wade. Bob Wade was the district attorney of Dallas County at the time when she sued, uh, you know, for... Uh, the imposition of a, a criminal statute that criminalized abortion. And she was like, hey, you know, it's violating my rights, I'm going to sue. And it worked its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, and as a result, Roe versus Wade became this infamous decision in American jurisprudential history. But we know that Jeremiah 
was told, ah, before I formed thee in the belly, God formed him. I knew thee. God knew the pre-born Jeremiah. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, before you were born, God says, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah was sanctified and ordained as a prophet of the Lord before he was born, before he was fully formed as a fetus even. So what do you think God thinks if Jeremiah's mother had gone into the womb and tore him to shreds or had some doctor do it? God would have been upset because he, even before Jeremiah came out of the womb as a born baby, God had already knew him personally and already chosen his life's course path. So clearly that is an indication right there. That's, if we only look that verse, we could close our Bibles and go home and say, hey, have a great Saturday. We'll see you next week if the rapture doesn't happen first. That right there ends the issue of abortion. But there's more. There's several more verses. Let's take a look at real quick. Let's go to Psalm uh, chapter 139. Psalm chapter 139 and verse 16 is going to raise an issue with regards to the same topic, babies and pre-born babies. Psalm 139 verse 16. Well, let's go ahead and start at verse 13 and work our way through 16 and see whether God said anything to the psalmist. This is written Oh, uh, you know, a thousand years before the birth of Jesus, let's see whether or not God has said anything about babies with regards to uh, the psalmist writing that down. So we pick it up in Psalm chapter 139, verse 13 says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. So the writer of Psalms is saying that God has already had a relationship with him when he was in his mother's womb. And of course, this was revealed to him after he was born. And when he started writing things down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he revealed that God already had a relationship with him. So God had a relationship with the psalmist prior to his being born while he was still in his mother's womb. He had a relationship with the super prophet of Israel, Jeremiah, while he was still in his mother's womb. And in fact, before he even became a fully formed fetus, God had already ordained him and selected him to become a prophet of God to the nation of Israel. But let's pick it up. Psalm chapter 139, verse 14 says this. This is pretty famous as a passage, but sometimes we hear some of these poetic uh, passages from the book of Psalms and we look at it more as poetry uh, as opposed to looking at it as something that God really believes in terms of factual and, and, and standards by which he will judge us. It says, verse 14, I will praise thee. The psalmist is writing this. Some people think it's King David. Some people think it's another person. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Verse 15, this is key. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. What is all of that saying? All of that is saying that the psalmist knew and had a personal relationship with God when he was still a fetus, before he became a fetus, when he was just a, you know, what is the argument? Protoplasm of cells just collected together in the womb. You can suck that out with a speculum and it's no big deal. Uh-uh, not according to the word of God. It says that thy did see my substance yet being unperfect. That means before all of my cellular parts came together and my little organs started to form, before all of that happened, which does happen in a progressive natural order, and you, you can look at it, it happens with every human baby, you know, they progress the same way. Now, some turn out to be blonde haired, blue eyed, some turn out to be brunette, some turn out to be black people, some turn out to be tall, short, fat, skinny, whatever. But they all kind of form a, together in the same progressive way. And this is what it says, verse 16, thine eyes did, God's eyes, saw my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written. In other words, the name of this person who was not yet born was already written in what we call 
the book of life. And here it is depicted. And we're going to look at that in the book of Revelation. If you're not in the book of life, uh-oh, you got a problem because you wind up in the lake of fire, which is the second death. So all 75 million of those American babies aborted since Roe versus Wade in 1973, guess what? They were written in God's book. And every one of those 75 million American babies knew God personally, and God had a plan for their lives, just like he had a plan for Jeremiah's. Jeremiah was going to be prophet of Israel. How many of those 75 million people did God have big plans for? Wonderful things that would bring peace and hope and joy to the people of the planet Earth. But none of those plans came to fruition. Why? Because the Supreme Court gave a woman, many times a young teenage girl, who, you know, she can barely decide which, which class she, she's going to major in in high school, much less whether or not to terminate the life of a human being that God already knew and selected aforetime to do something big for him during the course of their life. 75 million people who were not yet born were already written in God's book of life, Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, and their lives were snuffed out. And God saw every one of them. And goodness forbid, we're going to get to a verse that, oh, it's kind of spooky, that, that says plainly that God has what we, the concept we have of guardian angels, that's actually a biblical concept, where it says that God has an angel selected to watch every one of those preborn children. How many of God's holy, mighty, powerful angels, 75 million of them watched as their selected guardian E, the kid they're supposed to be looking after and shepherding through life to accomplish God's will, got torn to pieces in the womb by a speculum held by a doctor who was authorized by the United States Supreme Court to tear that child to pieces because he was considered non-viable. Not viable. Not if you don't have a job and you can't pay your rent, you know, people say, well, you're not viable. That's why you can't get a loan. How, what's your credit rating? Well, it's X, Y, Z. Oh, you're not viable for purposes of a loan. So non-viability doesn't mean that you uh, should be put to death, torn to pieces. So clearly, we find out here in the book of Psalms, God is looking at the preformed child in the womb before it even becomes a fully formed fetus as a human being that he has a relationship with. And the psalmist says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members are written, when in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So before I became what I became, you already knew me, and I was already important to you, and I was already somebody that you had big plans for in this life. And so that's really what, what the Old Testament says. Now we're going to jump, if we could, into the New Testament. Remember, um, the psalmist said his name was already recorded in God's book of life. And I've got sort of the artist depiction right here. Here's our book of life. Now this is exactly what the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, says about this book of life. Goodness forbid, if you're in the book of life, you are important. If God puts your name, sir, in his book. That means you are somebody to him. And every child that's ever born, that's not of the will of the mother or father. Yes, yeah, so having sexual intercourse causes the different DNA of the male donor and the female donor, the egg cell and the sperm cells come together and blah, blah, blah. But really God put all of the biochemical processes together and in place so that that would happen exactly as planned. So God is the one who's responsible for the conception and the birth of every child. Doesn't matter who he is or what his parents are, or whether he's loved by his parents or whether his parents are married to one another or care about it. a person by virtue of the fact that they are created by God in the image of God. Even though sexual intercourse between two human beings is the platform through which it occurs, God is the author of the life of every one of those ch children. And so therefore, you have to get permission, not from the mother, or the mother and the father, or the mother, father, and the Supreme Court of the United States, to kill the kid. You need permission from, and, and he, my friend here is pointing, he's saying, you got to get God's permission. And so the question is... You think God's going to do that? No, God, <laughs> God's not giving permission to kill little babies, right? God loves everybody, but he especially loves kids. Every single, every single kid... Special. Saying in the mic there? Every special, every kid, no matter if it's special or non-special, 
they're all special. God bless you, sir. That you Thank get a prize you, today. You, uh, the God Kathy God. track. God bless you, man. He gets the God. Kathy track. And I appreciate your support, man. I, I See, th this is the American people. The American people were never given a chance to go to Washington, D.C. and vote whether they wanted abortion on demand. They didn't come and ask me. They didn't ask my mom. They didn't ask my sister. They didn't ask this gentleman right here. It was sua sponte, a decision made by politically, I would submit to you, corrupt and morally devalued individuals who were promoting an agenda not in the best interest of the American public and not in the best interest of the human race, whether you be an American or a Russian or a Chinese or an African. Life is life and life is important in God's eyes. So let's take a look and see what it says in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. This is what it says there. It says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. In other words, God is the only guy that can blot somebody's name out of the book of life. He's the only perfect judge who's perfectly righteous. The Bible says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Justice Scalia wasn't the judge of all the earth. Justice Roger B. Taney, who wrote the Dred Scott decision saying black people are not fully human and can be bought and sold as animals, he wasn't the judge of all the earth. He was the chief justice of the Supreme Court, but only for a little bit of time. And of course, his opinion was reversed by others because it was wrong. So human beings can make mistakes, even when they're well-intentioned, though I would submit that some of those decisions, Dred Scott, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, and Roe v. Wade were not motivated by the people's well-being at the time. So let's jump on to the very next passage in the book of Revelation. Let's go ahead and stay in the book of Revelation and let's go ahead and take a look at the book of life because remember it is mentioned by Jeremiah and by the psalmist that my name before I was born, before I was even a fully formed fetus, was already written in God's book of life. This book of life, that's an important thing. And I would submit to you at the very least at the moment of conception, when the sperm cell hits that egg cell and it becomes fertilized, I don't care whether the sperm donor is a rapist or an evil guy or Adolf Hitler himself, the child is not responsible for the evil of the parents. You cannot carry forth vengeance and judgment upon an innocent child that you are attributing to the father or the mother. And so therefore, if the preborn child, which we just looked at in scripture, to find out the preborn child's name is already written in God's book of life. And only God can remove you from the book of life. So if a medical doctor goes in and tears a baby to pieces in his mother's womb, and the Supreme Court says, oh no, that's not murder, that's okay because he was pre-viability. He's just a fetus, he was pre-born. The Supreme Court can tell you that's okay, but if God is the judge of all the earth, and by the way, all, all Supreme Court justices were little boys and girls at one time. They, they played with toys and they went poopy in their diaper and had to have the diapers changed at one point in time, right? They just grew up and went to law school and through political connections and maybe, you know, some were very bright, you know, I was kind of bright in law school or whatever and, and all that, you wind up on, on, on the Supreme Court. But that doesn't mean that they're infallible and beyond moral conflict. And what we saw yesterday is that the Supreme Court wrote an opinion that said not only was Roe versus Wade bad, it was a disastrous opinion that wasn't even remotely associated with any legitimate legal analysis regarding the Constitution. Goodness forbid, for almost half a century, people were conducting their lives killing human beings, baby Americans were being killed thinking that it was okay because some really smart person with a Harvard Law degree said, this is okay because they're not human. They're pre-viable fetuses. And now we find out, oops, we were wrong. So all of those people that aborted their babies, 75 million of them are now finding out, holy crap, you mean when they told me it was okay, it really wasn't? Uh-oh, now you got to face God on Judgment Day and you, hey, what's up, brother? Good seeing you, man. Uh, you got to face God on Judgment Day. You also have to face God regardless. Well, it wouldn't have to be because of what the law says. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Right. If the law says it's okay, and then the law we, says it's not gotta, okay, it doesn't matter. 
Come. <laughs> you, you come jump in the camera. Pe people are here, but, but come so they can see a face and attach a face. Say that again now. All right. <laughs> I said that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the law says. If something is wrong in God's eyes, if the law says it's okay, if God says it's wrong, uh -oh. it's wrong regardless. That, that's what this man is saying. So yeah, we got. So you're saying, because you're saying basically all these people that did it before, now that the law passed that says they're not supposed to do it, it's going to be like, oh my God, I did something wrong. But the law could change next year and be like, you know what, which that's is, the case. So does that mean they're going to say they did something which right? Which is exactly my point. So we got two people that have said basically the same thing that the Bible is saying. That the judge of all the earth isn't the Supreme Court of the United States, isn't the International Court of Justice, it's the God of the Bible. And he's going to judge everybody at a point in time called the Great White Throne Judgment. And everybody whose name is written in the Book of Life that gets killed by man, the Bible says, you know, the, the man who sheds blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth in the Old Testament. If you kill the innocent, then eventually, maybe not in this life, but certainly in the next, you're going to give an account for those things that you did. And so we're looking again in, in the book of life. And again, we already read two passages in the Old Testament where we found out that preformed fetuses are already written in God's book of life. That means they are human beings to him doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says or what some justice says or what some judge somewhere says or a doctor saying, oh, it's just a protoplasm and, you know, if it's not viable, you know, he can't, you know, run a marathon on his own when he's in the womb. Well, if, if, as I said earlier, if he was put on the North Pole with no clothes, a five-year-old, six-year-old or an Olympic gold medalist, you know, uh, Olympic decathlete, you put him on Antarctica with no clothes, he's going to be non-viable too. So that was the standard that the Roe Court used to justify killing American babies because they were supposedly non-viable. And so therefore you could kill them because they weren't really human. But we know now that that's nonsense because in the Old Testament, both Jeremiah and the Psalmist were written in God's book of life before they were even fully formed as a fetus. So God says, I put them in my book of life and therefore they're important. Here's what Revelation says, Revelation chapter 12. Again, the reference to the book of life. It's repeated many times. We're only going to look at two passages. But why is God talking about this book of life? Because everybody in there is a person to him. And all 75 million American babies wrongfully and illegally, you know, aborted, murdered in their mother's womb since 1973, every single one of those 75 million babies was in God's book of life. Oh, here and his microphone so they can hear you. Psalm 139.16. We just read that. Oh my gosh, see? Hi, we got three people. See, God's plan is already laid out. Uh-oh. So, so, so when an abortion happens, you're getting away of God's plan. Now, now, here's a guy who just walked up. Now, he didn't know that five minutes before he showed up, we actually just read Psalm 139, verses 15 and 16, which says that a human being is a human being before they are formed into a fetus in the womb, once they're already, once they're already in the book of life, we find out then that God, God, let me and let me go ahead and move on to to the next verse, guys. I'm I'm recording though, so if you guys are gonna have a debate, if you can move back a little bit, I'm just I'm just I'm I'm recording for YouTube. But thank you, man. Appreciate it. And there you go. Three people and all three have voted in favor of not aborting babies. And, and all three of these people, none of these guys are theologians. We've got one woman, by the way. One of these people are, is a woman. And she's not in favor of abortion on demand. She's in favor of God's law. And three people, uh, uh, a black female, a white guy, and an older white gentleman, all three are agreeing that killing babies is wrong. Why? Because... God has put the names of these children, all 75 million American babies aborted, were already written in God's book of life. And here's what it says in Revelation about the book of life. It says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the work. Now, guess what's going to happen when the abortion doctor who was told by the United States Supreme Court, it's okay, you can charge a fee and get rich aborting American babies. It's okay. He's going to say, well, Supreme Court of the United States said it was okay. And in fact, I made quite a living. I lived in a mansion, had a yacht, because I aborted a lot of American babies. He's going to stand before the judge of all the earth 
on the last day and the books are going to be open. And when God sees all of these names of all of these persons that God wrote in his book of life that were deleted from the book of life by the abortion doctor, he's going to have to now give an account and that accounting is going to result in the eternal separation of that doctor from the Lord in the lake of fire. So an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is in the Old Testament. That isn't done away by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's suspended by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody can be forgiven and be saved whether you had an abortion or whether you did an abortion if you come to Jesus. But if you don't, you're going to get judged from the book of life based upon the works that you did. And all the people that aborted their babies and all the doctors that helped abort the babies are all gonna give an account for removing a living being that God created in his own image from the book of life, even though they were killed before they became a fully formed fetus, an embryo as they called it. So now let's go ahead from the book of Revelation. Let's take a look, last couple of passages we're gonna look at today um, and, and, and we'll wrap it up here. I appreciate you guys taking the time to come out and look at that. Let's take a look and see what it says in the Gospel of Matthew. So now, now we're moving. We went to Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, found out that he was selected. Jeremiah, one of the most famous prophets in the Bible, was selected by God to be the prophet of Israel before he was even formed into a fetus. And we found out from the psalmist, I was a child, I couldn't speak. So the, the baby in the abortion clinic can't say, doctor, hold on a second, Could I, I'd like to have a word with you. Look, my mom doesn't like me, but I would really like a chance to go to kindergarten. I would like to at least get into the first grade. Could we hold off on my execution? That kid would say that if he could speak, but the, the fetus can't speak, he's a baby. And so psalmist said, I couldn't speak. But Lord, you selected me and, and you provided for me and all of that and it was wonderful. So there is the standard by which we are to judge our conduct. Now, the last couple of passages we're going to look at before we end for today, we've got a show of a short to the point message. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 18. Now we get to the point, and this is kind of interesting. You know, Jesus himself is speaking about, not just people, right? Everybody, Jesus is, you know, he's about love. He loves, every, Jesus loves everybody, right? Even sinners are loved by Jesus. In fact, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish. Even the sinners. Jesus said, I came not for the well, but for the sick. I came for the sinners, not for the saved. And so Jesus loves everybody, but he loves kids especially. And we're going to find out that Jesus has this special, special care and concern for children. And that raises the specter of what happens when you go into the abortion clinic with that baby, which is really a human being that hasn't come out of the womb yet, even though it's called an embryo or even though it's called a fetus, God has already written that person into his book of life and given him a plan for life that will be interdicted when the doctor kills the baby. But let's take a look and see what Jesus says about children. In fact, little kids are especially beloved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 4 says, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So little children, in Jesus' paradoxical upside down way of viewing the world, the little children are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because they're humble and they're sweet and they're innocent and they're pure, right? So there's an especial type of concern and protection that Jesus gives to these kids. Because he says in verse 10, a few verses later, he says this. He says, take heed. Take heed means beware. Be very careful, he says, that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, listen to this now, their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus is telling the adults, the Pharisees, the supposedly religious righteous people, you got to be you better be very careful about what you do with kids you got you're supposed to love everybody but you have to especially be loving to kids be very careful what you do because jesus is warning them that my father has appointed each kid a special guardian angel in heaven and their angels do see the face of my father every day can you imagine what the guardian angel for some kid that gets aborted in the womb reports back to god like little Susie that you assigned to me to shepherd them through their life on the planet Earth just got torn to pieces 
by a doctor at the command of their 20 year old uh, mother because she didn't want to date. God bless you guys. Thank you for your input. South Beach Gospel Ministries, if you want to see the video a little bit later. Thanks, South, Be South Beach Gospel Ministries, right here. Yes, yeah, on the back, you take the track there and you'll be able to pick up and, and see your comments on YouTube a little bit later. Thank you. God bless you, man. And so Jesus is saying there's guardian angels not just for you and me, they're out doing street evangelism or if you're a pastor or a bishop or something. No, every fetus, every conceptus, every egg that's fertilized by a sperm cell has a guardian angel assigned, has the baby's name written in God's book of life, and the angel sees the face of God every day. If you go along and kill one of those little kids that the guardian angel was looking forward to shepherding through life, he's going to go back and rat you out to God. He's going to say, God, the Dr. Joe killed my little kid. I was supposed to go through life with him and, and guard and shepherd. And now his body is torn to pieces and being donated, you know, to science. And then he goes on to say, Jesus is speaking here. Four verses later in uh, Matthew 18, verse 14, he says, Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that even one of these little ones should perish. Perish means to die. So Jesus is saying God doesn't want even one baby in America to be aborted. He doesn't want one baby anywhere else to be aborted. But by the way, no other nation, I've already pointed that out, has the draconian abortion laws that the United States of America has. Even the former Soviet Union doesn't have rules like that. You know, China, which is kind of, you know, they, 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 they got rules about it. You can't have too many kids because we got too many people. But even they haven't aborted almost a hundred million of their own citizens in medical clinics throughout the land. Only the United States of America has done that. So now let's get to the last passage and we'll wrap it up for today. Luke chapter 17, Gospel of Luke. Let's take a look at that and let's go to verse, uh, let's go to verse 2. Luke chapter 17. Okay, Jesus, again, as I said before, is a big fan of kids. He likes kids, and it, when his disciples said, hey, get the kids out of here, we got the master speaking, and Jesus was like, no, no, suffer the little children to come unto me and prevent them not. In other words, allow the little children to come to me and don't prevent them because of such is the kingdom of heaven. And so this is what Jesus says about the ones who hurt a child. He says, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he be cast into the depths of the sea then he should offend one of these little ones. So what Jesus is saying, to translate into modern standard English, Jesus is saying, you'd be better off having a millstone tied to your neck and thrown into the sea. And when I was a kid, I was like, what's a millstone? I didn't know what a millstone was. A millstone is, a, in essence, a 2,000-pound donut that's used to crush grain. So you, you, know, you pick some barley or some, some bran, you throw it on a concrete floor, and then you take a big giant concrete wheel looking like a donut, and you roll it over the grain, and it crushes the grain, and you can make bread out of it and all that kind of stuff. So it's about a 2,000 pound cement donut. Jesus is saying you'll be better off having that tied to your neck and thrown into the sea than what God's going to do to you if you hurt a kid. So what happens when you tie a 2,000 pound stone to your neck and you're thrown in the sea? You die. That's what happens. You will drown to death. Jesus isn't saying that God's going to drown you if you hurt a kid. He's saying what God's going to do to you is worse than dying. What could be possibly worse than death? Well, we have the answer right here. The lake of fire, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The lake of fire is the place where all the people that didn't get born again by faith in Jesus Christ are going to wind up forever. And all the abortion doctors and all the unrepentant aborting ones that killed kids who were innocent, whose names were already written in God's book of life, are going to eventually wind up there unless... They come to Jesus first. And so that is our assay through the passages. We looked at six verses really quick. One, two, three, four, you know, seven verses, four in the New Testament, three in the Old Testament. And it made clear there can be no debate that a pre-born fetus, a pre-born embryo, even a egg cell that's been fertilized by a human sperm cell is considered a human being 
In God's eyes, their name is already written in God's book of life, and therefore anybody that does anything to molest or harm the fetus, the embryo, or even the fertilized egg will incur the wrath of God. And so with that, my man Louie is over here, former FBI guy and his wife, and I haven't seen him in years. Louie, I thought you were retired, brother. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it up. I'm going to talk to you. My man Louie is right there. I got to go chat with him. So those of you guys that haven't yet liked and subscribed, South Beach Gospel Ministry, God bless you guys. We did a special teaching today because of the Roe versus Wade reversal. And so the position of the Bible-believing Christian should be that abortion is wrong regardless of what the highest court in the land says, what the highest court in the International Court of Justice says. Because God says fetuses, embryos, and even fertilized egg cells are human beings in his eyes and they're already written in God's book of life. And anybody that blots them out is going to incur the wrath of God and wind up in the lake of fire forever if they're not born again by faith in Jesus. So with that, we're going to end it today. We will see you guys next week. We'll have a special teaching again. We're going to have a second special uh, teaching in a row. We're going to be talking about the founding fathers in America and whether or not America is a, a, you know, a Christian country as we see the 4th of July approaching and the anniversary of the United States of America. So until next week, if the rapture doesn't happen first, God bless America for reversing Roe versus Wade. Thank goodness. It's a dollar, day late dollar short for 75 million American babies that are already dead, but at least we can stop the carnage or at least it's being slowed down. So with that, until we come back next week with our special teaching on the Founding Fathers in the, in, in the Bible, uh, we will see you guys next week. Like and subscribe, YouTube, um, hit smash the like button, make comments, and click on the notification button and you'll get the videos as soon as they upload. So God bless you guys and you know, good job Supreme Court of the United States. You guys don't always get it right, but yesterday you did and God is certainly pleased and thank goodness maybe uh, it'll defer the wrath of God upon our nation for the godless decisions that we've made through the years. So with that, we're out. God bless you guys and we will see you guys next week here on South Beach.